Well, folks, we have an unplanned learning opportunity. Today, we are going to learn about duplicate destructive bits. If you've been following along with the Festo didactic series I've been doing on this Mech Lab trainer, in the previous video, we made it so that if you put a metallic part on our conveyor, it comes down, sort of drops, and it puts it there. And if we put a plastic part on it, it'll go past the sorter and come on across. And unintentionally, I walked us right into a perfect duplicate destructive bit exercise. And just so you guys know, I have already recorded all the videos on this. I've recorded all the videos on the stacker, all the videos on the handler, and I have integrated all of this into one PLC and recorded the entire video series and was literally sitting there watching this, getting ready to upload it. And I'm like, oh my, how did I manage that? So this is something that is normal that we do need to understand. In the previous video, I walked us through how to make a basic start, stop, seal in circuit to get our conveyor running. Then I talked us through how to do the same thing with a timer to keep that conveyor solenoid down long enough to get our metal part off the conveyor. And then I said right after that, we can do the exact same thing with our conveyor run. And I walked you through doing this one right here. And rung three is writing to output five and rung one is writing to output five. So when we say a duplicate destructive bit, that is what we mean. Now, before we get in the weeds of understanding duplicate destructive bits, there are three types of viewers watching this video. We have the ones that have just been following along with the Mech Lab series and are just trying to learn to program PLCs. You're right where you need to be, and this may be the most important video of this series. My second group is getting ready to write in the comments that duplicate destructive bits are illegal and the PLC should have not let you download this program or that duplicate destructive bits are bad and Tim, you should not be teaching people about this. Or since you have a duplicate destructive bit, the last rung wins and it completely ignores the first rung. Just take your hand off the keyboard and quit typing. That way you can become like the third group who can look at this program and determine the exact outcome of it. And this is an exercise that we do on a training week. And what I love about this is there is no way to make it through this exercise without understanding how the PLC scans. Now there are two types of scan cycles that we need to understand depending on which PLC you're using this with. We have the control logic, the compact logic scan sequence, and I have a video that goes into the details of how this exact exercise works with it. Just check out our lesson section. And then we have the Micro 800, MicroLogix, and SLC scan sequence, which I usually call the traditional scan cycle. It doesn't mean that it's the old scan cycle. But in these cases, a PLC will read the value of its physical inputs and update the boxes that we go and look for ones and zeros in. Then it's going to run its program. And even though this is incredibly fast, it still only does one thing at a time. It's going to start at rung zero with the left instruction and work its way through each instruction to the right. Then go to rung one and go all the way through to the end of the program, then it's going to update its physical outputs based on what are in the boxes that we put the ones and zeros in. The easiest way to explain this one is on a whiteboard. That way we can talk through the program scan. Also, I've omitted rung two just so we can talk about output five. And some of you are going to say, well, shouldn't the inputs be on the left, outputs be on the right? From the point of view of the PLC program, these are just boxes. So it doesn't really matter where you write them at. All right, let's go through it one time with everything off and then work our way through it. This instruction is going to go look for a one at input four. It does not have one, so it will be false. It's going to come here and go down to this lower branch. This instruction is going to go look for a one. It does not have one, so it will also be false. Now, since I have two falses, it does not skip over this. It's still going to look at every instruction, every scan. This is going to go look for a zero at input six. It has one, so that is true. 
I do not have a continuous path of truths from left to right, so this is going to be false. And this is the key part to understanding this. False instructions do things. A false output energize is going to go write a zero to output five. It doesn't care if it already has a zero in it. It's still going to write a zero again. Then it's going to go to rung three. This instruction is going to go look for a one. It does not have one, so it will be false. It's going to go here, come down. This instruction is going to go look for a one at output five. It does not have one, so it is also false. This is going to look for a zero at the timer Q. Now, if you're in connected components, it's a Q bit. If you're working through this in Studio 5000, it's the done bit. It does not have one, so it is true. I do not have continuous path of truth to left or right, so this will be false. That's going to write a zero to output five. And this will also be false. So that's going to write a zero to everything but the timer preset. Okay, now we're going to work through rung three. We're doing this for two reasons. For those of you who are coming from the Festo Mech Lab, this is kind of where we left off and it seemed to work fine. Also for the group of you that says that the last rung wins and it'll overwrite anything the first rung did, this will be important. So I am going to put a one in input ones box. That will be the part present sensor that we started the conveyor with. I know everybody just wants to gravitate to this now, but a PLC always does the exact same repeatable scan. So even though we could sit here and say, well, this rung won't have changed, let's just look at rung three, we still have to think through it. So this is still going to go look for a one at input four. It does not have one, so it is false. It goes down here. This is going to look for a one at output five. It does not have one, so it is false. This one looks for a zero at input six. It does have one, so it's true. I do not have a continuous path of truth from left to right, so this will be false, and that will write a zero to output five. Then we come here. This is going to look for a one at input one. Now it does have one, so it will be true. It'll go down, and at this moment in time, and I know a lot of you get ready to say, well, isn't that true? Because isn't that a ceiling? No, no, no. At this moment in time, this instruction goes and looks for one. It does not have one, so it is still false. This instruction goes and looks for a zero at the timer queue. It does have one, so it is true. I do have a continuous path of truth from left to right. That is going to make this output energized true, and that will write a one to output five and start our timer. Then it's going to go back up here. This looks for a one at input four. It does not have one, so it's false. It's going to come around. It's going to go look for a one and output five. Now we do have one. And this is now true. This goes and looks for a zero at input six. It does have one, so it's true. We do have a continuous path of truths from left to right now. So this top output energize will be true. And that's going to write a one to output five. This is going to go look for a one at input one. It does have one, so it's true. Now, it'll go to the slower branch, look for a one at output five, and this will be true. This case, it looks for a zero at the timer queue. This just happened, so it has not had time to get up to our preset, so it still has a zero, so it's true. That's going to write a one to output five and continue timing. Okay, so now our part starts moving, and it's going to go past our part present. This instruction is going to go look for a one. It does not have one, so it is still false. This is going to go look for a one. It does have one, so it is still true. This is going to go look for a zero. It does have one, so it is still true. I do still have a continuous path of truths from left to right, and that's going to write a one to output five. Now this is going to go look for a one at input one. It no longer has one, so it will go to false. Then this looks for a one at output five. It does have one, so it's true. This looks for a one at the qubit. We haven't been on long enough, so it is still true. This is going to be true. It's going to write a one to output five and continue timing. All right. And then after a certain amount of time, our conveyor stopped because we got a one in the qubit. This looks for a one in input four. It does not have one, so it's false. This looks for a one at output five. It does have one, so it's true. This one looks for a zero at input six. It has one, so it's true. This output energizer is true, so it's still writing that one. 
Now this looks for a one at input when it does not have one. This one looks for a one at output five. At this very moment in time, it does have one. So it is still true. This looks for a zero at our timer Q or done bit. It does not have one. So this goes to false. And a false output energize goes and writes a zero to output five. And a false TON writes a zero to everything but the preset. So at this point, you really feel the last rung does win. But in order for it to truly win, this has to have zero effect on it. So the next question I always like to ask here is, what's going to happen if I press my green button? I'm going to put a part not at the part presence, just something you can see. I hit my green button, and the conveyor starts. Now let's talk through why. So we pressed our button. It's going to put a 1 here. This instruction goes and looks for a 1 at input 4. Now it will be true. Because here this instruction goes and looks for a 1 at output 5. It does not have 1. So at this very moment in time, this is false. And this instruction goes and looks for a 0 at input 6. So it is true. I do have a continuous path of truth from left to right. So this output energized will be true. And it will write a 1 to output 5. This instruction goes and looks for a 1 at input 1. It does not have one, so it's false. But now this instruction goes and looks for a 1 at output 5. And rung 1 did write a 1 to it, so it is true. This instruction goes and looks for a 0 at the Q. It does have one, so it's true. And that makes our output energized true and our timer time again. Now we have one more to go through is this stop button here. Because again, if the last rung is really controlling this, it should not affect it because we have this seal in here and it should be waiting on the timer queue. I'll put my part back on. I'll press the start button. I'll press the red button and it stops. Also, just so we can go ahead and see this part of it, I'll put my part in front of it, red button, it stops. Now let's talk through why. So in this case, we are pretty much in the situation we were here right now when I pressed the green button, or you just saw me doing the part present, and this goes back to a zero. Now, I'm going to press my red button, and that is right here. This instruction is going to go look for a one. It does not have one, so it is going to be false. This instruction is going to go look for a one. It has one, so it will be true. This instruction goes, looks for a zero. It does not have one, so now it is false. And a false output energize is going to go right a zero to output five. Continues on down. This goes, looks for a one at input one. It does not have one, so it is false. Now this looks for a one at output five. It does not have one, and it goes to false. Now this is about my 10th video doing this last wrong wins exercise. And I realize there's a camp out of you that just really wants to stick with the last wrong win statement because it does simplify what you're doing. But if the last wrong truly wins, the first wrong can have no effect on it. This is a compromise and it is done by following the exact scan cycle. Arguably for the rest of your exercise, you could simply delete this, but since I've gotten us into this situation, I want us to go ahead and walk through how to resolve this and keep both of these in. And the key is to sound out what you actually want this to do. I want the green button to be able to start this or the part present. And when you say that or word, those are branches. So we're going to simply right-click this corner right here, insert branch above, and I'm going to grab this part present, and I'm going to drag it to right there. So now the green button will start this, or the optical sensor, or if the conveyor is already running, which is our seal in, we're going to continue to run. As long as the red button is not pressed, and our timer is not done. And when you hear the and word come out of your mouth, those are items in series. Now, one more thing before we delete this last rung is we still have our TON down here. 
So we're going to bring a branch down around our conveyor run. And we need to put our conveyor run time into the lower part of that branch. And that pretty much has pulled everything out of rung three. So we'll right click and delete it and download this program. And now I press my green button. The conveyor does start. Put a part on so you can see it moving. And it does stop. I press the start button again. The stop button also works, but I can put the part on the beginning of the conveyor. And it runs past. Or I can put the metal part. It sees the inductive prox and it sorts it. Don't rush through this exercise. Take the time to think through this one and understand how we can determine a very predictable output with a duplicate destructive bit. Now, nowhere in this video have I said that duplicate destructive bits are a good idea, but here's the issue with you that are saying you need to remove the duplicate destructive bit is, I just completed this whole video series and it was in there. And when we have a problem with this sensor, we will have to troubleshoot this duplicate destructive bit. Once you understand this really well, let's go on to the stack magazine because after this exercise, the rest of this Festo Didactic Mech Lab series is going to be a breeze. Click here to follow me over there.